Hi, my name is Martin Kering. I'm the head of the Economist Group's World Ocean Initiative, which imagines an ocean in robust health and with a vital economy. The World Ocean Summit and our Inside Our webinar series are an integral part of the work we do on accelerating a sustainable ocean economy. You can find out more about the initiative's work, including coverage on key themes discussed during our webinars on our website, ocean.economist.com. Welcome to today's discussion on Achieving Sustainable Aquaculture, sponsored by Calista. Aquaculture is the world's fastest growing food production system. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization predicts that it will produce about 59% of fish for human consumption by 2030. There's enormous potential for aquaculture to provide sustainable, nutritious and safe food uh, to a growing global population. However, as fish farms uh, companies scale up to meet this growing need, the aquaculture industry must overcome challenges to ensure sustainability throughout the supply chain. Feed and farming processes have been under the spotlight in particular, and fish health and welfare are, are now under close uh, scrutiny as well. Policymakers have an important role in ensuring the sustainability um, and management uh, of aquaculture and in boosting, of course, acceptance of farmed fish uh, among consumers as well. So this Inside Hour will therefore examine how to increase sustainability in aquaculture supply chains. As I mentioned, the discussion today is part of a series of events in the run-up to our World Ocean Summit Asia Pacific, which will take place virtually from December the 6th to December the 10th this year, and also the World Ocean Summit 2022 in Lisbon from March the 1st to March the 3rd, 2022. I'm joined today by three excellent, very experienced panelists. So first of all, Ellen Shaw, President, Chief Executive and Co-Founder at Calista. Elena Delgado Nordman, uh, she's Marine Lead and also responsible for WWF partnerships at Tesco. And also Andreas von Scholten, he is Chief Executive at Baramundi Group. You will find the full biographies and um, details of our panelists on the screen under this media player. Uh, there are also a few additional resources there, links to relevant articles on sustainable aquaculture from the World Ocean Initiative. I would like to once again take this opportunity to thank Callista for their support of this event. Um, so I'd like to structure today's discussion in three main parts. So first, I'd like to look at the key sustainability challenges for the aquaculture sector. And then I'd also like to look at the investment needs in aquaculture and how to meet them. And finally, also looking at how to create supply chain partnerships and collaborations. So without further ado, let's start with the discussion around the key sustainability challenges for the aquaculture sector. I would like to start with Alan. With your experience in biotechnology and feed ingredients, what do you see as the main challenge affecting the sustainability of the aquaculture sector? Well, yes, Martin. It's, uh, I mean, we're talking about the protein gap here. Uh, I think most of the audience appreciate the big picture numbers, but just for those that are catching up, we're talking about world population moving towards uh, 10 billion people. How on earth do we feed those additional uh, people? That's a lot of mouths to feed. And we're talking protein, not carbohydrate. So that's the focus. And aquaculture is absolutely in the frame as one of the fastest growing sectors. But the issue is around sustainability. And also, how do we, uh, how do we, uh, get new ingredients into the uh, supply chain. Uh, conventional sources of protein uh, are there because they're available uh, and because they're competitively priced. So we use feed ingredients today because we've been using them for a long time, either fish from the ocean to feed other fish or land-based protein, uh, aka soy. It's available and it's competitively priced. That's the current system. To be able to compete with that or displace that, we need to find alternate sources of protein that not only provide the nutrition that the current protein sources have, uh, but also that can be produced sustainably. We cannot continue to use more land and more water in producing plant protein, and the world oceans are at breaking point. So the critical factor is getting new sources of alternate protein into the supply chain, but also ensuring that the quality is there and the quantity is there. And that's so important. There's no point having a quality product if you can't produce it at scale. So you need quantity. And there's no point having quantity if the quality isn't there. 
Yeah, great points, Alan. And as you mentioned, I mean, it's, you know, if you want to scale, you know, you have to make sure that it is done in a sustainable way and getting new ingredients into the supply chain, as you mentioned, could be one of the ways to do it. And you, you highlighted the pressure on land and water resources. So that, that, that's crucial. I'd like, like to go to uh, Andreas now. Um, I mean, obviously you have vast experience in the animal health and aquaculture sectors. Why is it so important for the aquaculture sector to operate sustainably? I think in, in addition to, to the broader goal of, of, of safeguarding our environment for future generations, aquaculture uh, players are, are increasingly looking to sustainability because it just makes makes sense. I think it's not only about um, you know safeguarding the oceans and environmental uh, imperative for the sector to thrive, but but I think also consumers are are shifting to their you know, dietary preferences, um, so so they want they want to demand more more sustainable proteins. Um, I think I, I think what what um, Alan mentioned was was right. I mean we have been focused on uh, on a. Uh, uh, using the oceans as the world's largest untapped resource for 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 how to make you know a successful scalable uh, fish production, uh, tapping into the the natural habitats of the fish, and really coming up with uh, innovative, uh, effective food production systems that we firmly believe are, are the oceans. Um, it has been under a lot of scrutiny, I think, uh, but but I firmly believe that this is this is one of the um, most efficient ways that we can solve the global protein gap in, in the future and, and one agenda we are very, very proud to be driving uh, to do things uh, in, in a, a much better way. And thanks a lot, uh, Andreas. And you highlighted, you know, the, there is this need for efficiency and also for, you know, bringing consumers on, on board with this. And of course, Elena at, at Tesco, you're responsible for delivering the company's marine sustainability strategy. Why is sustainable aquaculture important for retailers? So I think I'm going to touch in around many points that you guys have already made. Um, when we like to take a step back and when you look at the future of our planet, so much of the food industry as a whole is at the heart of the crisis. We need to deliver healthy, sustainable diets, affordable for all, to a growing population. And this comes with many challenges. Fish is a really important international commodity. It can provide um, protein would learn lower environmental impact and the demand for fish is increasingly um, growing in developing countries. Overfish stocks have uh, been increasing according to FAO data so that's one of the challenges that um, that we're facing also linked to aquaculture and then as you guys said aquaculture volumes have now surpassed wild capture. It has is a farming area with a lot of potential to help feed this increasing population. And it has absorbed most of the growth or all the, if not all the growth um, in the global demand for seafood uh, in recent decades. So it will still continue to play a critical role. Then what we need to do now is to work against the clock to ensure that all the operations are sustainable with minimal environmental impact. And feed is a key area of focus that um, you know, I'm pretty sure we'll discuss further today, but many other challenges and areas that still need uh, much work, such as welfare, bringing in more circularity, transparency and traceability are key, implementing, implementing nature-based solutions. Um, yeah, all these things are some of the things that we should discuss in aquaculture going forward. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Elena. And, and you highlighted, you know, this this growth, um, you know, in developing countries. And of course, we already have the problem of overfish stocks that, that you mentioned. So we need to look at, as you said, at, you know, nature-based solutions. Feed is a key focus, as you mentioned. Um, and, you know, you all talked about, you know, the need for this kind of scale, but doing it in a sustainable way. So, um, you know, I'd like to discuss a little bit more around this, uh, you know, these investment needs in aquaculture and how to meet them. And actually, at our recent World Ocean Summit in March, we heard that aquaculture now produces similar quantities of fish and seafood as capture fish, 82 million tons in 2018, according to the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. So the sector is expected to at least double by 2050, offering trillions of dollars of uh, investment opportunities. So, Andreas, I mean, you have been leading on aqua in an aquaculture business for many years now. In, in your opinion, is the aquaculture sector, including the feed industry, 
equipped to manage the expected large expansion of aquaculture globally in a sustainable way, of course. I think there are a lot of uh, very positive trends um, driving towards towards aquaculture. I mean, you mentioned yourself that aquaculture has already become the the, the largest contributor of of, of fish, uh, with with really zero growth expected from the from from the wild caught fisheries. Uh, we are all looking towards aquaculture to uh, to solve the the protein uh, you know challenges of 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 the world. Um, I think we we have already. Um, uh, developed uh, a number of different species. Everybody has has seen that the tremendous growth that has been coming towards salmon. Uh, I represent, or our company represents, a, a new species called Barmundi. Uh, I think that the more focus there is on, on alternative species, on new species, because we cannot just be, be harvesting from, from 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 very few parts of the world. There has to really be, uh, we have to use more of the planet. And I think this is where I find particularly uh, of interest the, the, the whole tropical area, which is largely untouched and a, a lot of room for, for growth, uh, which one of the species that thrives very well in, in a troubled context is, is Barmundi. Uh, what we have, um, I think what, what has been a bit uh, uneven is the level of investments going towards the agriculture sector. A lot of money has been going into to developing salmon for the past 20, 30 years. What I think is extremely exciting is what I've experienced firsthand in, in the last five years is an incremental amount of investment coming from companies, countries, uh, with really um, a, a strong belief that that there is going to be a need for more uh, species to 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 all chip into the uh, to to the increasing demand. Um, so so I think uh, are we equipped? Uh, I think we are getting there. I think we are uh, we are certainly investing in all the right places when it comes to genetics, vaccines, uh, hospital practices, uh, optimal farm systems. So I think we it, it's it's a journey. Uh, I would say I'm very confident, very positive from where I'm where I'm standing now. Uh, that we will be able to solve the challenges, but it's it is important that we all really uh, drive in the right direction and we all see things what it is and and not be uh, I think um, uh, too distracted with uh, all kinds of different uh, rumors and, and and things that are that are swirling around you know the the, the aquaculture. Uh, we all really want to do things the right way. So so I think it's um, uh, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, brilliant. And it's great that, you know, this, this optimism is very important. As you said, you know, there's lots of room for growth in a sustainable way. And uh, maybe the investment hasn't been even, as you said, you know, maybe there's been too much focus on certain species. Um, so there's lots of potential to diversify there. I'd like to ask Ellen as well, you know, from the perspective of a leader in the aquaculture feed industry, how can the sector manage the expected expansion sustainably? Yes, well, <clears throat> we mentioned food security earlier. Uh, but what we're really talking about here is feed security. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest bottlenecks, as Andreas uh, is well aware, in, in aquaculture is actually access to feed. The, the aquaculture industry uh, needs a diversity of supply. Uh, we need to increase the protein ingredient basket substantially from where we are today. Uh, we're too concentrated on, uh, as we said earlier, fish meal and, and soy. Uh, and that's really uh, where we're all heading. And, and, and I see microbial protein, uh, which is largely enabled because of modern technology. Uh, I think you, you're already aware we're, our project is uh, into uh, its 30th year. It was first developed in Norway by Statoil uh, back in the early 2000s, uh, extensive uh, trials. Uh, but it's really the culmination of significant investment. Uh, 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 innovation in terms of uh, modern fermentation. And we talked about investment. Uh, our first world scale plant, which will service Southeast Asia, I'm pleased to say. Uh, I'm not sure if Andres is aware of that. But our first world scale plant, which will produce 20,000 metric tons of feed kind, which is highly concentrated protein, greater than 70% protein content, virtually no fiber or ash, and all essential amino acids. It's a, it's a complete meal in itself. Uh, that is being built in China, and, and uh, we're already looking at expansion. But the cost of that is about $80 million. Now, the good news is that plant is fully funded, but we're already looking at the second and the third plant. And by the time we built our first two plants, the market for our product will have grown more than the volume that we'll be producing. 
Uh, we anticipate having over 500,000 metric tons of feed kind, our, our, our branded product, in the market by 2030. But by then, the market for the product will have grown by more than that. And of course, we'll need a lot more than $80 million. Uh, the important thing is that that 500,000 tons has taken absolutely nothing from the current uh, food chain. And as I think we've, we've, we've noted before, our famous factoid uh, in terms of land and water use is a 100,000 ton feed kind plant is built on the, the, a land of about 10 football fields. And that produces 100,000 tons per annum, as I've said. If it was soy, the land required to produce the equivalent amount of protein would be the size of Chicago or three times Washington, D.C. So that's the future, modern industrial fermentation using virtually no, uh, zero arable land, very minimal land and virtually no water. And uh, that, that, that is the only way uh, we cannot keep taking things uh, from the planet. And this is a great opportunity to put it back. And one other point I would make is, you know, more than 60% of uh, quality grain in the world is directed to the feed industry. And not just aquaculture, but the feed industry. If we can find alternate sources of protein for the feed industry, primarily aquaculture, but also pigs uh, and, and other livestock, then that high quality grain can be redirected directly into humans with massive efficiency gains because animals, as we all know, are not very efficient protein factories. Cows are the worst uh, and, and fish are about the best. But any introduction of new novel sources of protein into the supply chain can, can, will have dramatic impacts at almost every level. Thanks a lot, Alan, and, and highlighting that, you know, this is not just about food security, but feed security. And it's that about 60% of grain directed to feed industry. That, that, that's really a powerful stat. And of course, as you said, and, you know, there's a need for this innovation and investment for that, as, as you said. I'd like to, uh, I mean, ultimately, this is about the, the customer and the consumer. I'd like to go to uh, Elena as well as, you know, obviously at, at Tesco and other retailers are the last touch point in the, con in the consumer journey. And, and both Andreas and, and uh, Alan touched upon the need, you know, for this kind of supply chain transformation. Uh, what would you like to see more of from the supply chain to meet your, but ultimately also your customers' expectations on aquaculture sustainability? Yeah, thanks for that. And in great points by by both Andreas um, and Alan. It's just there's so many things to talk about. I would like to discuss the points that they've discussed as well. Um, but anyway, being at the end of the chain, it's it not only brings public scrutiny, but it also brings a lot of responsibility. And consumer awareness is growing. Uh, this is being helped by um, media. Um, it is easily accessible, new documentaries, and also the fact that I think overall awareness of the importance of um, or or how reliant we are on nature and our planet is just becoming more and more the norm. And with a year like this one with COP, there's more discussions about it as well. Um, so there is a lot of expectations uh, already out there. And what we would like to see from the supply chain is um, is just keep working together on on more and more of these different aspects. So, touching before I go to one of my main points that I want to get across is that touching on this on the feed nutrient basket, that's one of the challenges that we're already seeing uh, coming through our supply chain, and it's not only on availability, but also on the possibilities of diversifying and the different restrictions between different different markets. Um, and investing on new alternative proteins and other ingredients that will not increase, you know, with the, with the right LCA, so with the right assessment that gives us the re reassurance that will not increase the environmental footprint is essential. So we have, we, we let feed producers have more options and then that also benefits the rest of the supply chain. Um, and one of those things that we've been very vocal and exploring a lot is insect protein. And that also brings that uh, factor of circularity and another big point that Andrea made, uh, Andreas made is about 
diversifying and investing in different species. And that goes into a uh, different conversation as well that is a very hot topic, which is healthy, sustainable diets and and how is how do we need to change our behavior in terms of consumers uh, moving forward to ensure that, you know, having the planetary boundaries in mind, what do we need to see to make sure that production and demand um, find that balance? So in, in terms of moving forward, what I would like to see, it's not only from our supply chain, but it's across the industry overall, and that is industry common goals that will help level the playing field and set the direction of travel. So meaning having common goals on on climate targets, on on marine reduction, for example, introducing alternative feeds, uh, deforestation and 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 the human aspect, human rights, which is also something always very important to discuss. For me, that will help drive a lot of change and 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 help investors understand which way we go as well. Okay, brilliant, and I mean there, there are so many interesting points that you mentioned. I mean this kind of working together on common goals and defining you know what needs to be done together in terms of climate, feed, deforestation. So that that's really crucial. And you mentioned the importance of those kind of partnerships in the supply chain and. I'd like to delve deeper in this topic of, you know, how to create these kind of supply chain collaborations and partnerships. And as we heard, to scale operations, uh, as we said, you know, there's this huge demand and can foresee this growing need um, to achieve this sustainability. And, you know, we, we need to look at, you know, things like transparency, traceability, as you mentioned, across the entire supply chain. So, Andreas, I'd like to ask you about the importance of, of these supply chain uh, collaboration, sustainability, what would you like to see more of from the supply chain to meet your demand and ultimately your customers' demand as well? And what role do partnerships play in facilitating this? Thanks. No, I think the um, uh, one single company is, is, is not in any position to make a difference. So I fully uh, appreciate the comment by, made by Elena that we, we really need to have common goals and a common view about what is really required? I think a lot of people get bogged down into uh, two, two, two small details, and so we we have always embraced uh, partnerships. Uh, even I, I speak to my I, I call my you know, the other companies producing Barmuni my 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 colleagues because I, I believe we're all in this together with a common goal on making uh, a successful industrialized production in a responsible and sustainable way. I think that that is our all our all of our common goals. Um, but I think it doesn't stop at that. I think we, we, we really have had a focus on on farming and, and, and a responsible product, a sustainable farm product. We, we are proud to take a lead on that in, in Asia, where we operate, Asia and, and Australia. Uh, and that goes across the entire value chain from, from genetics uh, to, to fish health, to the feed we use. So right now we use the, uh, a predominantly plant-based feed formula, uh, which is something that we are Con continuously uh, asking our suppliers and partners to to develop even more sustainable feed. And I think had it, we, we, there needs to be some companies sticking out and really asking for, for for things to change in order to really drive change. And I think we are we are proud to be one of the, those uh, companies that that are, are quite firm with with this with this agenda. Um, now I think, but 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 as I said, we're not alone with this, and and we we, we have a very collaborative approach. So, so we have actually made a few partnerships with renowned institutions and companies, uh, all with the in intent to to drive change. So, so one example is uh, around a genetic improvement program that we have uh, with um, uh, Wageningen University and James Cook University. Uh, we also are working with uh, Temasek Life Sciences in Singapore uh, to, to jointly uh, develop uh, superior genetics that will benefit um, the, 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 the production cycle. Uh, another example of a partnership I will mention is around feed, uh, where we have uh, made a partnership with Louis Dreyfus Company, uh, one of the largest uh, aqua trading commodity houses in the world, uh, to, to, to jointly develop what we call sustainable feed. Uh, we firmly have a, a vision that it should be possible to, to have a 100% sustainable feed diet uh, coming in so that we don't have any adverse impact on the environment uh, for our growth of the fish. So we need to make a, a full circle uh, our credit system. It's something that we are working very clearly towards. Uh, I think there has to be more of these, more types of these collaborations. I would certainly welcome broader collaborations across more companies and more industries uh, because we we do need to work together to solve these big challenges. 
Yeah, that makes sense, Andreas. And, and thanks for highlighting some of the collaborations you are doing in Asia, Australia, uh, on genetics and fish health. Uh, and you mentioned the partnerships around feed as well. And uh, so, Ellen, of course, uh, you have recently partnered with Thai Union to demonstrate the benefits of greater traceability, for example. How can aquaculture players further collaborate and co-create alongside feed producers to help advance aquaculture sustainable, sustainably in the future? Well, uh, Elena and Andreas made some very good points there. Uh, uh, the comment about responsible and sustainable really resonates. And that was at the core of uh, our collaboration with Thai Union. Uh, we were able to uh, validate a fish meal free diet for the first time ever uh, in shrimp at scale. Uh, these were very large pond trials. It was an amazing uh, program of work that, that went, went over uh, essentially through, through two years. And uh, the architect of it uh, was the head of sustainability at Thai Union, who uh, regrettably has, has recently left and repatriated back to Australia. It was one of the most amazing people I've ever had the honour and privilege of working with. Uh, and, and she she just really uh, took this whole thing to a, to the higher level, and it was about responsibility. It was about uh, best practices. Uh, it was it, it and you know a fish meal free diet uh, was a huge first. And and I think two years ago or eighteen months ago, I was at the Brussels Seafood Show uh, with a celebrity chef uh, cooking shrimp that had been farmed in Thailand. Uh, on a fish meal free diet with, with feed kind as the uh, core primary uh, uh, protein uh, ingredient. The, 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 the blend, uh, the formulation was built around feed kind. I'll come back to why in a second. And uh, we were handing these shrimp out to people at the show. It, it was a tremendous uh, a milestone for the industry. Uh, but now here we are two years later and, and we're building, as I said, a, a world scale plant. But Thai Union is just one example. And the other thing that we've discovered since then, and this goes really to the heart of uh, the, this functionality and the, the basket uh, and the nutritional basket that, that, that Eleanor was talking about, is uh, we've now discovered uh, that our product, because it's microbially based, uh, is essentially a probiotic. And the shrimp uh, have reacted extremely uh, favorably to the product, and we've seen fairly dramatic reduction in early mortality syndrome, EMS, uh, and uh, uh, Vibrio. Now, th these results, which are actually going to be uh, transformational for the shrimp industry, uh, will be published uh, over the next couple of months, and, and I suspect uh, could well feature uh, in, in a few of your uh, the, the, the future shows that you're talking about, because they are that dramatic. Uh, it's just similar to a human going and buying a yogurt in a health store. It's all about gut, uh, gut improved, gut health. And that's one of the uh, functional benefits of uh, microbial protein that you don't get in other forms of protein. Uh, in the case of salmon, feed kind in the diet essentially cleans up the gut completely uh, uh, because salmon uh, get enteritis uh, as a consequence of the soy. Because at the end of the day, Carnivorous fish uh, were not evolved in nature to, to, to eat plant protein, and the industry has been struggling with that for a very, very long time. So weaning uh, uh, spe species, shrimp is our primary target at the moment in Southeast Asia, but weaning shrimp off fish meal completely is a huge milestone for the industry and came through uh, a, a world-class partnership, as you mentioned, uh, with Thai Union, uh, 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 who, who are leading leading the, the, the effort here. But it is a, it is about protein content. It's also about functional benefits, and and that goes. Uh, and then once you've got those sorts of benefits in that core ingredient, then you can actually change the formulation and make room for other things. And as Andreas knows, there's not a lot of room for baggage in a fish feed formulation. Everything has to be accounted for and everything has to, has to add value. But we're actually now introducing a product for the first time that can be the number one ingredient and you can literally build the formulation around that, which again is transformational for, for, for the aquaculture industry. Thanks a lot, Alan. And yes, I mean, as you said, I mean, fish meal free Diet. I mean, that, 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 that sounds very exciting and great progress. And as you mentioned, the decline in the shrimp disease that you see, the improvement in gut health, 
uh, and you know the the partnerships that can help to bring these things about that that's that's super exciting. I'd like to go back to Elena, of course, because uh, you know partnerships is really at, at at the heart of what you do. I mean, you are WWF partnership manager and the environment team at Tesco, and where you are overseeing the partnership goal to half the environmental impact of the average UK shopping basket. Can you tell us a bit more about the importance of supply chain partnerships and collaborations in aquaculture? Yes. Um, so aquaculture is part of um, fit, sits within that um, basket metrics that well the, the aim of the of the partnership with WDF that you've mentioned. So the basket metrics are the way that we're measuring progress in aquaculture is part of that. And um, the way that we work together with WDF, it just in having a partnership in place. It just opens so many other doors, so many other conversations. It brings you a different perspective in in many areas. They they push us further. We push them further. We understand the balances and and how practical things can be. Um, where to set the targets to make sure that they're ambitious enough, but there's not gonna um, scare many away, and therefore we can bring more in the journey. Um, all these transformational talk, um, reach out and using each other's network. That's that's lo that's a lot of the importance of having this type of partnership. Um, and convening the industry together is is another of the important things and, and strong outcomes um, of the things that we're doing in the partnership. All the great stuff happening is is the research done together again using the resources and using our supply chain to test different things and then come up with reports um very helpful stuff and all this has been done through the partnership I and mean, we have countless reports and and projects that we can talk about uh latest ones on on waste um on at farm level uh, but this is more on on agriculture less less on less on um aquaculture but then another one on insect protein uh, focused on the UK and what that needs to see, the growth that we need to see to make it happen. Um, good example like that. But just to bear in mind that there are different types of partnerships. So um, you can also have like they, the, the other speakers mentioned about is with other businesses. And that is as strong. Uh, so pre-competitive collaboration is something that help so much to overcome different barriers and good examples um, at the moment an aquaculture related one is the North Atlantic Pelagics Advocacy Group and what we're trying to do there is um, improve the management of the Northeast Atlantic Pelagics that also go into feed aquaculture feed and there we have together different businesses from feed manufacturers, processors and retailers, and even, uh, and it goes to international levels. Now even um, it, we have members from Japan. So having such a great strong voice together also helped drive things forward. So again, uh, partnership with NGOs, partnership with businesses, um, partnerships with uh, universities, all these things are the steps that help you um, jump a little bit ahead of what we need to see happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot, Anna. And, and these different forms of partnerships that you mentioned with other businesses as well, I mean, that, that's crucial. I mean, seeing this as, you know, one goal and, and kind of uh, working towards that, uh, which is all about sustainably feeding a growing population. And uh, some of the collaborations you mentioned are very important and transformational, as you said. Um, now I'd like to look a little bit more at some of the other challenges that we face. I mean, the, we talked about some of the you know challenges around um, you know investment for example uh, the need for this kind of collaboration um, now there's also of course the you know the need to you know the, the new informed consumer but also technology and innovation so Ellen I'd like to ask you about what do you see as the biggest barriers you're facing in rolling out sustainability initiatives and how are you overcoming them we've we've we've, we've mentioned the importance of capital um, Everyone gets that, but it, but let's put it in. Let's put it into perspective. Uh, we're talking about a hundred thousand ton plant, hundreds of millions. 
uh, a billion tons of capacity. Uh, you're talking a billion dollars of investment. So these uh, the, the aquaculture feed, we've talked about feed security. It's a volume game. Uh, it really is. I mean, for people like Andreas uh, 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 and even Eleanor to to start thinking about the the supply chain for for, for her customers, uh, you need feed security in the supply chain. Uh, you know, for Thai Union to uh, take a chance and uh, 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 develop a new formulation. Uh, they don't just do it for one pond, as Andreas knows. They're, they're going to do it across all their ponds for, for a particular species. Uh, and that means that uh, people like Andreas and, and Eleanor need to know that the person or the company that is supplying somewhere in that supply chain, that you need to know that they're going to be around for a very long time, uh, that it isn't just a lab project, uh, that they do have the where for all and capacity to scale and that the uh, quality of the product will be there, that the, that the operations will be safe. Uh, uh, I've been involved in uh, industrial supply chain uh, in, in, in various formats from the pharmaceutical industry now to the food industry uh, throughout my entire career. And uh, security of supply uh, is essential to everything that we do. We, regardless of where you are in the supply chain, uh, one broken link uh, and, and, and the whole chain breaks. And so this is really around ensuring that all this great innovation, uh, which we're absolutely seeing, which is now real, uh, uh, this isn't a science experiment anymore. As I said, where people like our company, but other companies, we're not going to do this on our own. There's room for many, many people here. They've got to be able to get from development to manufacture, and that is going to require substantial capital, but also skills, skills and resources. Uh, as our company is growing, as we move towards commercialization, as we're looking at multiple sites in multiple geographies, uh, even the skill mix across our company uh, will need to change. We need more engineers uh, is a good example. So uh, we're all evolving and, and we all have to grow and we have to grow together. I think this comment about partnership is so important. Uh, collective learning uh, and everybody can make a contribution. Um, you know. Uh, People, uh, we're, we're at the front end of this chain. Uh, Eleanor's at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the other end of the chain. But, you know, we all need to know what we're doing and we all need to make sure we're pointing in the right direction. But risk, risk manag management, risk mitigation, this is super important to the investment community. And I think in, uh, 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 with regard to uh, certainly where we are with microbial protein, we're bringing a product to market that was first developed 30 years ago. So there's very, very, very little technology risk, and there's certainly virtually no market risk. I mean, the, the, the industry is desperate for new sources of alternate protein. Uh, it, it's really around execution risk, and uh, uh, access to capital is central to that. Uh, and you will see... Uh, you, you know, that's why uh, events like this are so important and, 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 and the great work that you're doing at The Economist uh, is we've got to encourage investment. We've got to give people confidence that the industry uh, is moving in a very progressive and positive way. Uh, and, you know, when you look at the investors we've got, we've got uh, Aquaspark, one of the world's leading uh, 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 Aquaculture investors. I mean, they, 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 they've essentially redefined the sector in terms of investing. Uh, but we've also got some of the world's largest companies and a DCO, one of the, one of the world's leading nutrition companies and one of the world's largest oil and gas companies that's uh, dedicated itself to weaning itself off oil and gas. Uh, it, no, no better project than to turn uh, one of its products into fuel, into food instead of fuel. Uh, and that's the future. It's amazing what innovation is allowing us to do. And of course, the advent of the uh, renewable, uh, or as, as we sometimes say, the free electron, uh, don't, don't, don't be under any illusions of the impact that uh, renewable power is going to have on the industrial landscape. And we're able to take full advantage of 
modern innovation and integrate it into a program, which I said was first developed 30 years ago in Norway. Uh, and so our ability to have a truly sustainable product, but also a product that is incredibly effective in terms of its protein and nutritional content, and as I said, the, the probiotic effect, uh, we're able to do that now because of modern technology and innovation and the fact that the world is very, very different to what it was 30 years ago. For example, natural gas prices 30 years ago were about $15 an MMBTU. It's closer to two now. Fish meal prices were in the low hundreds of dollars a ton. Now it's somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000, depending on the time of year. Uh, renewable power, uh, electricity is driving down to zero uh, over the next 10 years with the advent of renewable power. It'll change everything. So I think we should all be extremely optimistic about what the future holds. And it is largely as a consequence of uh, modern uh, technology tremendous innovation, uh, but also perfect timing with an industry that is looking for uh, a solution to a very large problem. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I mean, you highlighted the excitement around this kind of new innovation, new technology, and, you know, all the new things that could be happening through, uh, you know, renewable energy, but also you highlighted some of the barriers. And I also wanted to really dig deep on those. And it's great that you mentioned those. So it's access to capital is, as you mentioned, your your main Challenge, but also creating that confidence more broadly, and hopefully we're contributing to that. But also skills, commercialization, risk mitigation, all these kind of things are important to tackle. So I'd like to ask Andreas as well, do, do these kind of challenges resonate with you? I mean, what are your biggest barriers and how are you overcoming them? Yeah, things I've, <clears throat> I've been listening with a lot of interest uh, to what's been said by both Elena and, and Alan. So I think... Uh, some very important points. I think all of us probably in, in many different ways experienced how fragile we are as a, as a, as a, as a, as a globe, as a, as a human species uh, in the midst of the pandemic. I mean, borders were closing, people couldn't can't travel, uh, there was no free flow of, 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 of products. Uh, I think that has really uh, gotten many people to wake up, even countries to wake up to, to, you know, we need to do things better. We need to really be uh, doing things more responsibly. We need to take better care of the planet and also better care of each other. Uh, I think when you talk about feed security, it's, it's exactly right. Remember, we deal with live animals. We care. And, and for these animals, 24 hours a day, uh, they need to be fed all the time. They need to be cared for all the time. Uh, it, it's not okay to not feed them for, for a week. So we need to really have 100% control of our food supply chain. And that was put to a test in the midst of the pandemic with, with everything stopping. So I think coming up with new solutions, um, in innovation is going to be key. Uh, I think what, what you mentioned, Alan, of, about your new innovation will be the holy grail uh, to be able to swap completely from, 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 from fish meal towards uh, a, a more sustainable alternative, a plant-based alternative, or, or, or otherwise, otherwise, I think would be tremendously uh, useful for, for for not only our company but for the for the agriculture industry in in, in general. So I would I would strongly uh, you know uh, welcome uh, w welcome that initiative. Um, so so I think um, uh, yeah I, I think that's that that makes me really excited about uh, the, the future. Brilliant. That's amazing. Thanks a lot, Andreas. And you mentioned the need for innovations and the pandemic, of course, had, had an impact in a way sort of creating this awareness around the, you know, we all connected, supply chains are connected. I'd also like to ask uh, Elena in terms of, you know, some of the challenges that uh, that Andreas and, and, and Alan mentioned, do they resonate with you as well? Or, uh, also, particularly from the perspective of the kind of consumer perspective and the retailer perspective, um, you know, is the consumer understanding, uh, you know, the seafood sustainability is increasing? And if it is, how it is influencing your practice and operations? And um, do you face any other challenges and how do you overcome that? That's a good question. So consumers, it's, it's, it's hard to say. So in terms of the, the insight that we get from consumers, it's, it's, increasing in terms of awareness but we're still away from from them fully understanding these very complex topics and i keep whenever somebody asks me about this i keep referring to the basket metrics that you mentioned earlier i think that's um that's the uh, the best way of communicating 
the areas that we have to work on on all these very complex issues uh, in a quite simplified manner. But still, the the amount of customers that go to that level of detail is is still not that great, even though the awareness is increasing. So, um, but with that in mind, um, you know the the challenges that we're facing because the 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 main theme is is truth. The customers do want to see sustainable seafood. They want to see the retailers and the brands doing the right thing, and they expect that to, they expect us to do so. So, the overall idea they have it very clear. The specifics I think is less clear uh, when you go into the details. What happens with everything? So, in terms of the barriers that we are facing to deliver that, I think the main thing besides cost, because cost comes into Pretty much every conversation when we start talking about feed and, and innovation is who's going to pay for it, where it's going to come from. There's so much the supply chain can absorb. We need innovate, um, investors. Um, you know, so besides that, I think it's been quite well covered. I would say alignment. So alignment covers different different aspects. So from goals, so having, and this goes back to my previous point, when companies, countries, um, different sectors have different goals and they're not aligned, it makes it very difficult to progress because these issues that we're talking about are across the board. These are common issues that we're all facing. And therefore, the more aligned we are and the more we understand what's going on, the easier it is to move forward together. And that's what we need to do. So going back to that collaboration point, that is so important. And then... So not only in goals, there's also misalignment on ways of measuring. And that goes, for example, into the carbon emissions. And that's something that we're all very aware that we all need to improve. And there's more um, emphasis now and scrutiny going down to scope three. And that will include and obviously includes the whole aquaculture supply chain. So we need to have more clarity on on which types of measure measurements we're using, how are we measuring this, and again, alignment in the tools that we use, which also I think that also helps investors. The further, you know, the more they see us working together and aligned, the easier it is for them to invest in the cost. Um, so yeah, I, I I would say I would say that's the main thing. Cause then one of the barriers that we have um, is rolling out these new initiatives, these new feed ingredients, these new innovations. And because we have shared supply chains with many other businesses, so the more alignment that we have, um, the, the easier it becomes to overcome these other barriers, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And you mentioned how important it is to have that, you know, the goal alignment, because as you said, if people are going in companies and organizations are going in different directions, then you can't really find that common ground. Uh, but you also mentioned uh, the need to, to measure uh, success in a way in terms of sustainability. Are you using any, because we haven't really talked about that in much detail, what, what, what is your view on these kind of newer technologies that are now coming into the aquaculture industry? I mean, through AI, for example, blockchain, data analytics, and these kind of things. And obviously consumers are, as you said, increasingly aware of the need for the, you know, supply chain sustainability. What is your view on these kind of new technologies? Are they already helping to measure success in the, in the supply chain? I think, I don't know how many of the audience would have visited uh, a salmon farm, for example, but so I have to say that we, innovation is a key part for any transformation, any, any way forward into the future. And I think there's a lot of innovation already happening and also that has happened in aquaculture. Um, we as Tesco and also in our partnerships, we are exploring different innovations and in how we can um, roll them out. We have an, an innovation fund with WWF that we're exploring some of these things. Um, but when I mentioned the, the salmon farm, when you go through through the process of the hatchery and also in the in the in the pens already, and I'm thinking one in Norway that I that I had the opportunity to go and see, sorry, in Scotland. Um, there's already so much technology in there that they know exactly how much feed is going into there to minimize the the waste. 
they know uh, the density and the, they can measure so many things already. And, and that has helped already in the past to improve things on, on, um, on, on waste, quality, welfare of the fish. So definitely innovation is super important. It has already happened, is happening, and it will happen. And we need more of it and quicker. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Elena. And Andreas, I'd like to ask you as well in terms of, you know, these, these technologies that can help to measure success and sustainability, you know, blockchain, data analytics, and these kind of things. Are you using these? Are they helpful? What do you need more in terms of technological innovation? Yeah, thank you. I, I think we, we do we do use it. I think there's uh, we, we're just really uh, at the at the beginning of of this. The, there's a lot more we can do. But I would say, as a company, we have been focusing on 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 the full on, on the full spectrum of, of of technologies from the the very beginning, which is the the genetic stage where we have the broodstock uh, fish that have been uh, you know selected over generations based on on different traits, and then we we then get superior. Out, out offsprings of, of that, which we call fry, uh, that are either faster growing, more disease resistant. So that already there, we give really the fish the best possible uh, conditions to to thrive in in the, in, 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 in in the open environment uh, from 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 the, from the birth. So I think that that's one area that we we have focused quite a lot on on improving and, and, and researching in genetics. And also when it comes to fish health, we also use diagnostics services, vaccines to also boost the fish. I mean, everybody knows vaccines now with the COVID. Uh, so everybody I think is, is clearly uh, aware of the advantages of, of, of this. Again, uh, to give the fish the best immune uh, response and, 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 and protection for, for what, what's to come in, in the open, uh, in the open waters. And then I think when it comes to at, at the farm, it's really, as Helena said, a very high-tech environment. Uh, there are cameras monitoring uh, the fish behavior, so you can see when they, they become hungry, uh, when you need to feed, when you need to stop feeding, all to really optimize the production uh, and to, to detect you know, different different uh, you know behaviors in, in the fish. Uh, so that is uh, you know on, on, in terms of automated feeding, uh, you know. Various ways of, of of measuring. Also, we we monitor the density levels to make sure that the stress levels are kept at a at a minimum with the fish. All this I would call a highly sophisticated uh, know-how and technology that we apply. And then moving on from that, I think when when we then uh, bring our product to the customer, that this is I think what you also referred to in terms of of a blockchain and, and traceability, uh, we are then able to very clearly tell the customer, this is this product, it's it, it's called Kulbara or Kombe, it's coming from from this particular site. And so they, they, they know fully uh, where this product came from. They know it's a product they can trust. It's been farmed in a responsible and sustainable way. And so we'll make them, you know, any consumer very sort of uh, happy that that they, they know what they are getting their hands on. So I think we, we really try to apply a very technologically driven approach to, to our production. Uh, but I, I even even with the advances we have been making, I, I feel we're just we're just getting started. There's so much more we can do uh, in the future. One, yeah, sorry, maybe we'll just add one point on 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 certification because that, that's also a measurement on on how well we're doing. And also to Elena's point, I heard you work with WWF. So do we. We have uh, just recently uh, made a partnership with them as well uh, to really be a, a leading force in Asia around driving certifications. So we already were the first company to achieve BAP four-star certification in in Singapore, where, where, which is our home base. And we're now looking to to expand that to to become uh, more certified, which also is again a testament to 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 how much. Uh, openness we would like to have around uh, our production uh, and also to be a, a leading star in in the uh, in in the in the area that we operate. So I think that that's just one example of also how we can uh, ensure that we we all um, uh, do things uh, in, in better. That's amazing. Thanks a lot, Andreas. And I mean, you mentioned how important it is from all the different stages, you know, of of, of fish farms. You know, the, you know the genetic stage. You mentioned you know the need for fish health and diagnosing and you know, kind of uh, measuring also the health of the fish and uh, the welfare and blockchain traceability in terms of creating that trust and transparency that you mentioned. And certification certainly helps, as you mentioned. Ellen, of course, you know, for you, innovation is really at the heart of what you do. And you mentioned how uh, technology and innovation is really driven, driven success for you. And um, I'd also like to ask you in terms of, 
you know, how, how do you see the future of technology, not only for f feed ingredients, but also more broadly looking at, you know, blockchain, looking at diagnostics and looking at, you know, the, the technologies that help to build that trust and transparency in the industry? Yeah, <clears throat> well, that's a, you, you, you just used a very important word there, trust. And in fact, the second word, transparency. Uh, Eleanor uh, uh, makes, makes an excellent point around the very real importance of alignment uh, in terms of you know, responsibility, sustainability. Uh, and I just want to pick on that and then I'll come back to the, 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 the very critical link with innovation. Uh, when people talk about sustainability, there's a tendency for us to immediately think of GHG, LCA, climate change, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that is, is only one side of the equation, which sadly, particularly with innovative innovation companies, innovative companies, they forget the other side of the equation. And that is, is the company acting res responsibly? Is the company itself sustainable? And this is so important that we make that we understand and appreciate this point that in, in, in the case of biotechnology, and I've been in biotechnology for, for as long as I can remember, I've seen as many failures as I've seen successes. And it's largely because people lose sight of that critical balance between, yes, we're going to try and change the world, but are we also going to be able to do it competitively? And can and will we be able to produce a product that people will be able to afford to buy? And yes, the pandemic has put uh, climate change in the spotlight. And I think that is absolutely fantastic. And it, it's given it a shot in the arm that it absolutely needed. If we're able to survive the pandemic, we certainly should be able to help save our planet. But there's a tendency for people to put the cart before the horse. And developing technology and, and, and developing products that sound sexy, if I could use that term. And there's a lot of branding, a lot of spin, a lot of marketing that's somewhat out of control in this sector. Uh, I know from being in technology for the best part of 25 years, particularly biotechnology, that a lot of some of the products that I'm hearing about now that have been touted as the best thing since sliced bread will never, ever see the light of day. They will never be made at scale economically. They are not viable. And the problem we've got and the problem that people like Eleanor has got and Andreas is being able to source that the wheat from the chaff and be able to recognize and have that capability in their organizations to discern a product that is going to be able to be produced at very large scale and is economically viable and also sustainable, as opposed to something that just looks good uh, in a press release uh, that's come straight out of the lab and could be 20 years uh, or never away from prime time. And, and, and I think that links this back to the importance of collaboration, but we're all in uncharted territory. Uh, I understand innovation. I understand how it can be abused. I understand how it can actually transform and change people's lives for the good and for the better. And I think as an industry, we all need to work together and we absolutely do need transparency. Uh, and we need to be able to articulate the benefits of what we're doing so that people truly understand. Andreas is not going to uh, look good in front of his shareholders if he switches to a key ingredient and then he finds that the company supplying him has gone bankrupt because it was actually never ever able to produce that product competitively in the first place. Well, we all need to be uh, careful, but at the same time, get the job done and be very mindful of sustainability on both sides of that equation. Yes, and thanks a lot, Alan. I mean, this is really important to highlight that we are talking about still, you know, a business that needs to be competitive. There are investors that need to be economic viability. And ultimately, as you said, it needs to be affordable. The end product needs to be affordable for, for consumers. And then, of course, sustainability is crucial. But forgetting these core elements of aquaculture, you know, would just be defeating the purpose. So this is crucial to highlight. Uh, the competitiveness, the economic viability angle, and the affordability angle, and then transparency and articulating the benefits, then gives the consumers the, the best choices in the end. But 
really crucial points. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I'd really like to thank uh, the three panelists. Such a great uh, conversation. It was, you know, we could, we could go on, of course, but uh, unfortunately, the time time is up on this occasion. Um, just to wrap up, I mean, we've learned a lot about, you know, how you know aquaculture can uh, reach its full potential. It must be more sustainable, of course. Feed plays a huge part in there. We also need to take steps to increase transparency and traceability across the industry. Certification was mentioned. Of course, there are crucial challenges. Uh, you know, we mentioned the need for investment, access to capital, the need to tackle fish disease, uh, creating confidence in the industry, uh, skills, resources, um, risk mitigation, management, key uh, uh, challenges. But we are addressing those, of course. And, uh, you know, a lot of excitement was uh, was expressed by all of the, the, the speakers around, um, you know, the collaborations, the partnerships that are being made in the industry, the opportunities for new innovations and technology, alternative ingredients, of course, but also artificial intelligence, blockchain, data analytics, being better to measure success. Um, and of course, there is this, you know, this need for this alignment and common goals that, that Elena, for example, mentioned. Uh, there needs to be the sustainability across the entire supply chain, from the site selection to farming operations, to feed and, and down to production, of course. So this whole value chain is important. And uh, and then, of course, Alan, you mentioned, you know, is the company itself sustainable? We shouldn't forget that, you know, there, there is also this need to uh, to be, you know, produce something that's affordable, uh, to have something that's competitive uh, in addition to being sustainable. So thanks again uh, to all the panelists for your time and, and of course, our sponsor, Callista. Uh, stay tuned, of course, for the coming events in the series. Uh, on October the 13th, we have a webinar coming up uh, that is uh, supported by Ocean Network Express on decarbonizing maritime transport. And of course, key dates uh, to mention again, the World Ocean Summit Asia Pacific, December the 6th until the 10th, a virtual event. And of course, our World Ocean Summit 2022, March 1st to March uh, uh, 3rd, 2022 in Lisbon, uh, where we will, of course, continue the conversation around sustainable aquaculture. So thank you again, everyone, and we hope to welcome you again soon. Thank you.